Thank you. And thank you, Nina. It is such a privilege to be here together and deeply humbling. And thank you, Kenny, uh, both of you, for creating this atmosphere of engagement and reflection. We are growing and we are evolving this community of ours committed to social change and ecological consciousness. We are discovering our strengths through our questions, through our frustration, our despair, and our joy. As we dare to see ourselves as a community of conscience and consequence. Latifah Simon, hearing the stories of young women rising. Wanjira Mathai, her voice on behalf of the Greenbelt Movement. 30 million trees, her mother, Wangari, recipient of this year's Nobel Prize. I have to tell you I met Wangari when I was 29 years old at the UN Decade for Women, and she put a human face on deforestation. She made me believe that a passionate voice mattered as she taught us, all of us, how African women were carrying deforestation on their backs as they would search eight to 10 hours a day looking for fire fuel to feed their children. Wangari Mathai changed my life. And 20 years later, um, last spring, I had the deep privilege of welcoming Wangari and her son, Wangira's brother, Muta, to our home in Castle Valley. When I met her, she was 44. She's now 64. And you could see what those 20 years had brought to her heart, to her face. And over dinner, I said, Wangari, what have you learned in these 20 years? And without even a pause, she said, patience. patience, the patience of trees, the patience of stones, what we all know in our own home ground. Yesterday I heard Peter Forbes calling for a new story in conservation, a story that celebrates both the land and the people, not isolated but integrated, bringing the knowledge of organic farming of the nearings in Maine to the wild wisdom of Aldo Leopold what he knows about wilderness. I heard Satish Kumar calling for an activism grounded in spirituality, not just politics. And we heard Michael Lerner from Commonweal address cancer as both disease and metaphor for which we find ourselves in modern culture, the healing that can occur. Stories of engagement leading to action, transformation. I do not believe we can look for leadership beyond ourselves. I do not believe we can wait for someone or something to save us from our global predicaments and obligations. I need to look in the mirror and ask this of myself. If I am committed to seeing the direction of our country change, how must I change myself? Change, it's what we're talking about here, change. How are we changing? Where are we now? And I hope you don't mind if I'm personal. In this next part, I look at two women on the front row. Nina Utney. And Jennifer Stoll. Dear, dear friends, and in their wild blue and wise, compassionate eyes, I see where I have been and where I am now. In Nina's eyes, I see a day in March, March 8, 2003, code pink. Thousands, thousands and thousands of women, children, men, community, gathering together on the eve of war. We walked from Martin Luther King Park down to Lafayette Square, only to find that the square, public square, was blocked, rimmed, lined with Washington, D.C. police dressed in black and combat gear and M16s. 
Medea Benjamin, the leader of Code Pink, had a negotiation with the captain of the police force, a very serious conversation of negotiations, why we were not allowed to proceed onto public space. Rachel Bagby, one of the most beautiful women I know, with one of the most God-given voices I know, focused her attention elsewhere. She focused her attention on one policeman in particular. And she began to sing to him, all we are saying is give peace a chance. All we are saying is give peace a chance. And other voices joined with hers. This policeman she was singing to was also African American. And in that moment of witnessing, I realized that neither one of them would be who they are or where they were had it not been for the civil descents of their parents, their parents' parents before them, and their parents' parents before them. And in that moment, the policeman stepped to the side, creating the open space of democracy we walked through. In Jennifer's eyes, I see my brother Steve. Diagnosed one year ago with lymphoma. I see his suffering through her eyes. I see him sitting at the family dinner table after he had gone through a very intensive cycle of chemotherapy that left his body ravaged and weak. I see him sitting next to his wife, Anne, in their living room with their daughters, Callie, Sarah, and Diane, with Brooke and I there at their side, my other brother, Hank, and our father, gathered together to hear what he learned at Commonweal. He spoke of healing, not cure. He spoke of gratitude for his life and his desire to be true to the integrity of his own voice. He brought us back each a stone and passed a bowl of stones around the dinner table. And he talked about how when he was walking at Point Reyes, he only picked up stones that had a hole in them. And he said, I know we have had a hole in our hearts. We can look at this hole in our hearts as a wound or we can see it as a window. May we vow tonight as a family to see it as a window. Another open space. Even the open space of democracy. You know, I think so often we think this is what's going on one hand of my life, this is what's going on the other hand of my life, and more and more I'm asking myself, how do we bring these two lives together in prayer? Seamless the garment we wear, our lives. And it is strengthened through community. Code Pink, Commonweal, family, our work. I want to share with you another quick story. Um, shortly after the Code Pink action, um, I was invited to speak at the University of Utah to deliver the commencement address. Can I tell you how horrifying that is? Um, it was particularly horrifying, or that's maybe too strong a word, but I don't think so. Um, in Salt Lake City, Utah, this was my alma mater. My niece, Callie, Stephen Ann's daughter, was graduating. It was about family. It was about community. It was about my people. We were at war. You'll remember uh, George W. Bush had just stepped onto the aircraft carrier Abraham Lincoln announcing mission accomplished. This was the following day. And I thought, if I don't have the courage to speak my own thoughts at this point in time to my own people, my own family, and my own community at my own school, then I have no business being there. And I gave a very short talk for 15 minutes about the open space of democracy. In the open space of democracy, there is room for dissent. 
In the open space of democracy, community is defined as the well-being of all species, not just our own. Thinking about Thoreau when he said, cast not your whole vote, but your whole influence. These kinds of ideas and urge the students to question, stand, speak, and act. After this talk, it was met with equal boos and equal applause. What can I say? Terrifying um, in your own community. And what I saw was the split within our own country. How do we have civil dialogue when we are not even civil to each other? After the talk, my senator, Bob Bennett, and it gets more complicated as it always does in Utah, also our neighbor, and more complicated still, my former Mormon bishop, uh, <laughs> came up to me and said, Terry, I just want to register my extreme dissent to what you said today. We talked, it was spirited, and then he said, you've inspired me to write you a letter. And I would like to share with you an excerpt of his letter and my response, an excerpt. Because I think it has everything to do with how do we bypass this political rhetoric that has diminished all of us in this country and find that point of humanity, our deeper selves. Dear Terry, as I listen to you outline things that are important to you, an interesting question popped into my mind. What would she be willing to die for? Waging war always creates the risk of dying, so any discussion of war raises that issue. Then I asked myself, what would I be willing to die for? The answers that came were predictable. At the front end, family certainly, followed by church, protection of community, and yes, finally the cause of freedom for others, as well as my own family and friends. And then he goes on to outline his concerns and thoughts. It was an incredibly thoughtful, provocative letter. I should tell you, it was a four-page, single-spaced letter, not on official senatorial stationery, but from his own computer. And this is an excerpt in my response. I'm embarrassed to tell you I was not able to answer his letter for months. I was haunted by what he had asked me. What am I willing to die for? And I realized for me, that wasn't the question. It's not what I'm willing to die for, but what am I willing to give my life to? <laughs> but having been grilled enough by my own father, I knew if I didn't answer it, it would not be credible. And let me just read you an excerpt. Dearest Senator Bennett, you asked me a critical question in your letter when I have pondered for months. What am I willing to die for? Before the war in Iraq, thousands of Americans turned to poetry to voice their opposition to the invasion, creating the largest written protest in the history of this country. 11,000 poems were presented to Congress on March 5, 2003 by Sam Hamill and W.S. Merwin. My words were simple ones. The erosion of speech is the buildup of war. Silence no longer supports prayers, but lives inside the mouths of the dead. After much thought, Senator Bennett, what I would be willing to die for and give my life to is the freedom of speech. It is the open door to all other freedoms. We are a nation at war with ourselves until we can turn to one another and offer our sincere words as to why we feel the way we do with an honest commitment to hear what others have to say. We will continue to project our anger on the world in true unconscious acts of terror. Democracy invites us to take risks. It asks that we vacate the comfortable seat of certitude, remain pliable, and act ultimately on behalf of the common good. Democracy's only agenda is that we participate. If we cannot engage in respectful listening, there can be no civil dialogue. And without civil dialogue, we the people will simply become bullies and brutes, deaf to the truth that we are standing on the edge of a political chasm that is beginning to crumble. We all stand to lose ground. Democracy is an insecure landscape. 
Two weeks ago, democracy felt a bit more insecure when I received a call from Florida Gulf Coast University. I was to learn that the freshman convocation with which I had been invited to speak last May was being postponed until after the election. This decision was made by the university president, William Merwin, not to be confused with the poet. <laughs> this decision was made because of criticisms I had made against George W. Bush in print. He felt my partisan views would be threatening to the university and could be harmful to his students. He said, quote, if a hurricane is threatening my university, then I'm going to shut it down. <laughs> and then I said, but what if it's only a tempest? <laughs> With all due respect, he didn't think it was funny. Um, <laughs> we had a long conversation, and he was very candid to his credit. He said, let me be very clear. The Board of Regents in the state of Florida, my Board of Tre Trustees at this university, are all appointees by Governor Jeb Bush. And my donors are supporters of the Bush brothers. In the name of political balance, he said, I cannot allow you on this campus before the election. <laughs> that same night, our family gathered in Salt Lake City to learn that my brother Steve's test revealed metastatic disease, that his lymphoma was progressing, that he was no longer eligible for the stem cell transplant we had all been praying for. With silence and with stillness, with sorrow and with love, we embraced the moment and each other and stood in the center of sacred time. Life, as T.S. Eliot says, turning shadow into transient beauty. The Arctic. I cannot sleep and slip from the comfort of our tent to face the low, diffused glow of midnight. All colors bow to the gentle arc of light the sun creates as it strolls across the horizon. Green steps become emerald, the river lapis, a patch of cotton grass ignites. My eyes catch the illumined wings of a tern, an arctic tern, fluttering, foraging above the river, the embodiment of grace suspended. The tern animates the vast indifference with its own vibrant intelligence black cap, blood red beak pointed down, white body with black tipped wings. With my eyes laid bare, I witness a bright thought in big country. While everyone is sleeping, the presence of this turn hovering above the river, alive, alert, engaged, becomes a vision of what is possible. On this night, I met the Arctic angel and vowed the 22,000 miles of her migratory path between the Arctic and Antarctica would not be in vain. I will remember her. No creature on Earth has spent more time in daylight than this species. No creature on Earth has shunned darkness in the same way as the Arctic tern. No creature carries the strength and delicacy of determination on its back like this slight bird. If air is the medium of the spirit, then the Arctic turn is its messenger. What I know is this. When one hungers for light, it is only because one's knowledge of the dark is so deep. Here's my question. What might a different kind of power look like, feel like, and can power be distributed equitably among ourselves, even beyond our own species? We can only attain harmony and stability by consulting ensemble, writes Walt Whitman. This is my definition of community, and community interaction is the white hot center of a democracy that burns bright. Despair shows us the limit of our own imagination. Imagination shared 
create collaboration, and collaboration creates community, and community inspires social change. The experience at the Florida Gulf Coast University has been a painful one, but it has taught me that this is not personal. This story is not about me. It's a shadow play that, where we are characters in this ongoing drama, theater of democracy. The students rose. The faculties rose. And next Sunday, the president and myself will join the students and the faculty in a discussion of how to keep this open space exactly that. I think together we've realized that what is most threatening to the status quo is dialogue, because honest dialogue and deep listening requires us to change to give up the rigidity of our opinions for the sacred heart of stories where we remember who we are and who we are not. My brother has shared with us that his cancer is teaching him to act and speak from a place of honesty, to follow what he loves, not to be simply responsible for what he does. If you would have told me one year ago that my brother, who's a pipeline contractor, would be advocating for a labyrinth to be placed in the center of this new international intermountain health care facility for cancer patients, I would not have believed you. If you would have told me that his focus on pipeline had shifted to that of a sculptor, of making a, statue, a sculpture out of granite cut and pulled and stretched that he would call lymphoma leaving and be able to bring it to Jennifer and Michael at Commonweal. If you had told me that alongside his Mormon scriptures, he is now reading Emerson and Thoreau and Rachel Remen, I would not have believed it. The other day he said to me, Terry, we are all terminal. How do you want to spend your one beautiful life? Mary Oliver, engagement, action, transformation. And now let me tell you the true transformation. And that has been my father. My father, fourth generation pipeline contractor. He wears cowboy boots that could kill spiders in corners. <laughs> he has a shrine to Ronald Reagan. And about a month ago, I said to my father, with all the love in my heart, we can no longer talk about politics. I am so sorry, but it's too painful. I did not know how to find dialogue. <laughs> when this happened with Florida, I warned my father about it, and I apologized because this was not a good time for controversy in our family. We were broken open with Steve. And he said to me, do not Apologize, this matters. When he found out what had happened, that I was not allowed to speak, he said, and when the students had invited me to come back, he said, I want to come with you. Tell the president a Republican's coming who's voting for Bush. <laughs> and then, as things progressed, um, I had said that my father was coming to the local reporter in the Salt Lake Tribune, and I warned my father. Then I called him the next night, and I said, I hope this hasn't caused you pain. And he said, Terry, the phone has been ringing off the wall. People are outraged. And I said, why? And he said, because I'm voting for Bush. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, are you? <laughs> and he said, I don't know. Engagement, action, transformation through love. How close does it have to get before we're willing to change? For my father, it was seeing his son, his beloved son, 
another hibakusha, another downwinder, his body ravaged by cancer. He didn't acknowledge that with his wife, with our mother. He has acknowledged it now. And his daughter, not allowed to speak. My father has changed. It had to be that close. How close does it have to get before we make the changes required for a full transformation of who we are as human beings? Isaiah Thalmeyer, you asked me last night, as we sat in a circle with your beautiful classmates from the Wilderness Charter School in Ashland, Oregon, you asked me how I have found my own heart in these troubled times. And I have tried to tell you today Isaiah, Nevin, Charles, Jesse, Stephanie, Vanessa, Alex, Rachel, Ursula, Caitlin, Marjorie, Hannah, Sylvia, Josh, Lara, Damon, Woody. These are 16, 17, 18 year olds among us who have traveled with their teachers to learn about opening their hearts to the challenges of social change. If you are here, would you stand? May you live your lives, may you see your lives as a beacon against cynicism and despair. And may you love this beautiful, broken world. In closing, this is what I would say to you, to all of us, what we learn together in the name of community, Nina, Jennifer. Rachel, the human heart is the first home of democracy. It is where we embrace our questions. Can we be equitable? Can we be generous? Can we listen with our whole beings, not just our minds, and offer our attention rather than our opinions? And do we have enough resolve in our hearts to act courageously, relentlessly, without giving up ever? trusting our fellow citizens to join us in our determined pursuit a living democracy. The heart is the house of empathy, whose door opens when we receive the pain of others. This is where bravery lives, where we find our mettle to give and receive, to love and be loved, to stand in the center of uncertainty with strength, not fear, understanding this is all there is. The heart is the path to wisdom because it dares to be vulnerable in the presence of power. Our power lies in our love of our homelands. Thank you. <laughs>